Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome back to uh, the first panel session where uh, we are going to start to get into the nitty-gritty detail of how we can uh, move forward on investing in a low-carbon India. After the very fine and inspiring speeches this morning, uh, it, it is very clear that infrastructure, both large and small, is going to be critical to the low-carbon transition not just of India, but of uh, all countries around the world. Uh, one of the shared challenges that we have is ensuring that, the that we meet the infrastructure challenge in the right way. Now, the right way is a bit like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. But in the case of uh, the low carbon transition, it's clear that we have a major set of issues that need to be addressed uh, across all countries. Uh, and what we'd like to delve into today is how uh, these issues of uh, planning, of risk management, of finance can be uh, adjusted or assessed or addressed in the case of India. And to help us meet that uh, challenge, to, to discuss these issues, we have assembled a very knowledgeable expert panel today uh, to take us through uh, some of these issues. So um, I'd like to introduce, uh, going from left to right, uh, Mr. Kenichi Yokoyama, who is the country director for the Asian Development Bank. Uh, Professor Ila Patnag, who is uh, with the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Uh, Damandeep Singh, who is the India Director for the Carbon Disclosure Project, and Vaibhav Chaturvedi, who is a research fellow with the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. So, uh, Gabriella this morning mentioned uh, the infrastructure challenge, uh, that in order to get to the low, uh, to the uh, development goals globally, we need around 6.3 trillion US dollars of infrastructure investment each year up to 2040. Uh, if we want to make that low carbon, it's more like 6.9 trillion US dollars per year. So the marginal cost of going low carbon is not that high, less than 10%. Uh, but one of the critical things that uh, is we need to address is, is issues around risk. And we've, we've got some questions that I'd like to start the panel discussion out by asking our panelists, um, starting with uh, Kenichi, um, how, how can we incorporate climate change risks into our infrastructure planning and management? What is the ADB doing to address these kinds of issues? Thank you very much for this opportunity. ADB is actually supporting India by providing about $2.5 billion of annual loan assistance for the sovereign side and additional $700 million for the private sector financing. And in this, actually this is only a a uh, small proportion of uh, what India uh, requires in terms of uh, investments. We, we note that the uh, uh, government report says about annually $160 billion uh, investment infrastructures required, <coughs> out of which about uh, $100 billion annually uh, infrastructure investment is taking place, of which uh, ADB's assistance is uh, uh, quite small in a sense. Uh, max $2 billion annually. So focusing is really on some uh, particular areas where uh, India uh, needs uh, uh, building new approach capacity and uh, uh, climate change e e adaptation mitigation is one particular area. And uh, we have uh, programs in the uh, energy sector for improving energy efficiency, renewable energy. And uh, as, as the urban minister says, urban is a, a pretty high investment requirement area, also requires a lot of climate change uh, efforts. 
Uh, we also have a rural side on the irrigation water use efficiency improvement and also uh, river uh, management in terms of flood management and erosion management. So those are uh, some areas and uh, we particularly, I, I just want to highlight one particular uh, project which is in Kolkata. Actually Kolkata, as I understand, has been identified as the one of the 10 hotspots of the climate uh, I mean, the change impacts. And uh, we have uh, started our engagement starting back in 2000. And in the meantime, uh, the uh, uh, master plan, uh, Kolkata uh, also prepared the master plan for uh, drainage and sewerage improvement for uh, by 2007. And in that uh, uh, plan, uh, specifically incorporated what will be the climate change impacts in terms of a sea rise, it's a low-lying city, and in terms of the climate change on the rainfall from uh, all the way up to the Himalaya. So the design uh, parameters of the drainage uh, have uh, reflected all these uh, climate change uh, impacts, and, and that has been reflected as a master plan. And uh, we started our assistance back in 2000, starting with $200 million. And initially, I think the uh, design may not have been uh, fully reflecting climate change, but over the years, uh, this has been uh, reflected as a uh, culminating into the master plan in 2007. And uh, uh, then all the uh, structures uh, work started uh, and uh, the first project of $260 million of ADB assistance plus uh, $40 million of DFID support for capacity building, all these uh, climate change I mean, uh, efforts also reflected, uh, was reflected and, and uh, it took uh, 10 years to complete. Initial uh, idea was complete in six years, but uh, there's a, a lot of implementation challenges over there. The second project has started in 2012 and is, is ongoing, $400 million. Again, focusing on the, uh, the drainage improvement. I, I think overall investment, uh, about half of the Kolkata uh, city has been covered in terms of drainage imp improvement. And uh, the lessons uh, we have learned is, uh, uh, first, I, I, I think uh, it, it's critical to reflect uh, uh, climate change impacts. But I think overall, uh, the lessons for India at large is uh, uh, still a uh, planning capacity of uh, pro uh, investable project uh, design is still under development. Particularly southern states are more developed, they can uh, mobilize their own funding and prepare so-called DPRs. And they is need some assistance for reflecting climate change, so we are providing technical assistance on that part. But the uh, northern states, uh, particularly the uh, low-income states, uh, like uh, uh, Bihar, UP, uh, northeastern states, uh, generally even uh, do not, uh, I mean, the, the, the challenge is really, we have to start uh, helping the uh, detailed design, investable project proposal, and then uh, including climate change dimensions, another uh, quite a challenge. And then urban space also, or uh, implementation uh, is usually uh, quite a challenge, requiring a lot of coordination between various departments, uh, utilities, electricity, uh, and uh, urban uh, road sector, uh, I mean, road departments. So again, the implementation capacity building, uh, Kolkata's case uh, took almost 10 years, uh, I mean, uh, to uh, that, uh, until we see the capacity is now fully developed. Uh, initially, they could, uh, you know, out of $200 million, $260 million, they could hardly spend $10 million. And that uh, ended up a 10-year implementation period. And, and now, by this time, that's $400 million project. We, I mean, capacity is finally, finally developed. And uh, we expect uh, uh, this project annually, uh, 50 to $60 million is disbursement is, uh, uh, I mean, anticipated. So, so in that sense, uh, capacity building, urban implementation, infrastructure coordination, and reflection of uh, climate change on, on top of climate change is a, a critical challenge. So we, we, we really, in, in terms of uh, Indian infrastructure investment, particularly I'm covering infra, um, urban sectors, uh, requires particularly support for uh, a lot of uh, efforts on, on planning side, on the uh, uh, particularly low-income state side in particular, 
and implementation side, urban infrastructure investment is, is a critical challenge. In a sense, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Ministries Empowered Committee once reported annually India requires 2% uh, of GDP uh, invested in infrastructure. But actual expenditure, I think uh, Minister and Ministry is making tremendous effort, but still uh, something like 0.5%. So all this requires more efforts on planning, uh, more efforts on, on building implementation capacity, particularly in the difficult coordination. Thank you, thank you. And um, you've highlighted the issue of capacity planning uh, and, uh, and uh, the cap capacity enhancement. Uh, Professor Padnake, from, from your perspective and as the, uh, uh, with the National Institute of Public Finance and, Pol and, Pol and Policy, what do you see as the main challenges along these lines? Do you agree that there's still some work to do in the capacity building process and particularly in financing and, and incorporating climate risks into, the, into infrastructure planning and management? Yama uh, painted that we are talking about infrastructure investment, new infrastructure investment of more than 200 billion a year, out of which we can get support from ADB or the World Bank for good infrastructure, resilient infrastructure, uh, climate adaptive infrastructure for about a few, few billion, you know, four, five mm. max. And we're talking about 200 billion. So, the rest of it has all got to be done by us. It has to be done by our legal framework, our institutions, our local bodies, municipalities, panchayats, state governments, union territory governments, uh, central government. And that's where the challenge lies. While we may have uh, legal, uh, we may have good intentions, we may have good policies, we may even get the finance so as uh, uh, Gabriela mentioned this morning, the finance for uh, climate adaptation is an additional 10%. So from 200 uh, billion, we are talking about maybe 220 billion. So that's not as big a challenge. Maybe we'd also be able to, you know, with the green bonds uh, and other financing mechanisms coming up, we'd also be able to get the finances. But the question and the biggest challenge in, uh, my, in our thinking and at NIPFP, you know, we, we are a National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. That's a place where I work. It's a Ministry of Finance uh, think tank. Uh, we do very unglamorous work. So, you know, we go into details of how, what gets implemented, what do you need for something to actually translate from big audacious goals to action, action on the ground where, you know, the action on the ground means municipalities, uh, urban governments, which are not really, you know, on anybody's agenda when, when they're talking about the big picture. So we start with something like the constitution. Whose responsibility is it uh, to develop standards? Which level of government? So is it, you know, the constitution gives uh, responsibilities to the center, the states, the municipalities. And that's really where at the end of the day, the enforcement is gonna happen. So the way we see it, the biggest challenge is the legal and regulatory framework for adopting standards, which will need to get adopted when we move to try to translate our goals into actions. Those standards then have to be, uh, so they have to be developed. I mean, you know, international bodies develop standards. From there, you have to de develop some local standards because conditions are different. Going from there, different levels of government or regulatory bodies have to adopt those standards. Then they have to enforce them, which is where the biggest challenge lies. You know, so it has to be, you know, let, let's say something, a building has to be constructed. The construction of the building will be done by, let's say, a private builder. Who is responsible for making sure that the building follows the standards that have been, uh, ha uh, have been adopted by that level of government? It is an engineer or an architect who works for that builder, 
that's, that's the first uh, port of call. The town planner who says this building can be built here and of this kind, and then the engineer and the architect. Now, it may surprise most of you uh, who've not really studied the nitty gritties to learn that these pro are not professional bodies, town planners or engineers. In India, these are still not professional bodies. Uh, where, you know, like a chartered accountant body where uh, you have to have a license and keep renewing the license. And if you've done something bad, then penal action can be taken against you. So an engineer passes his civil engineering degree in the 80s, let's say, could have built buildings that are all not following norms and still get away with it. These are unregulated uh, professions and that's something that has changed in countries where they do try to adopt those norms and enforce them, but not in India yet. So those are the kind of challenges that we see. Next, you know, a m municipal body like Shimla, uh, and uh, we know how building construction has happened in Shimla. I mean, most, most of us who read papers see these horrors, uh, or those who have visited Shimla see the horrors of what has happened. Now, according to the latest information I have, the Shimla Municipal Corporation has two, two engineers who are supposed to ensure, enforce building codes in Shimla. How much can two people do? Uh, I'm not even talking about the kind of corruption one might expect in some of these uh, government uh, bodies. I'm just saying, even in terms of capacity, so I completely agree that you know that's where the capacity constraint lies we can think of big projects you know those that come from the world bank or loans adb projects those get implemented well but the moment you come down to smaller projects uh, in conversations that uh, so nipfp has had workshops where we've pulled in all regulators financiers and uh, a series of workshops in the last one and a half years or so uh, trying to talk to people about how they think uh, things can improve. And we've had to actually go one step backward where now we are working with IITs and asking them, are you even incorporating climate change into the courses for structural engineering uh, that, or, uh, with, uh, um, that students are learning? We are talking to uh, mm, institutes where uh, they teach urban planning to ask whether they are introducing this thinking into urban planning. The kind of capacity creation that we need to do for the kind of work that we are, and for the kind of investment that we are talking about, even in only new projects. So I'm not even talking about retrofitting. I'm saying, you know, we are at that stage where even if we do the new ones right, that will be big progress. But for the kind of work, for the kind of capacity creation that we need to do, there are huge, huge challenges. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we're focusing, uh, you focus very much there on uh, the education, the skill sets, trying to get the professions up. Uh, this is certainly a very important kind of basic needs that need to be, in, to need to be enhanced. Damandeep Singh, you're with the Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, a, a global um, think tank that looks at uh, the issues around risk and disclosure and so on. What's your perspective on, on how India is going in terms of incorporating climate risk into its infrastructure planning and this issues around capacity and, uh, and education? Um, thanks, Anthony. Uh, yeah, it's the climate risk is, is something that Indian uh, policymakers have actually, I think, uh, not given it as much importance as it was required. Um, from the longest period, we're, we've been shying away from calling it climate change till Paris. I know most of the embassies here were actually talking only in terms of energy efficiency because the Indian bureaucracy did not want to discuss climate change. That was the thinking. So, and since Paris, things have changed, as the minister pointed out, and as also somebody pointed out, but still the understanding of climate risk, and specifically uh, the discussion since Paris on, for instance, say the task force on climate-related financial disclosure, 
which has now been endorsed by uh, the likes of BlackRock. And you know, they're asking companies that they've invested in and they've invested largely in, in, in a lot of India finance and oil and gas sector, where they're asking companies to disclose what is their climate risk on that framework, which was adopted at G20 last year. And uh, uh, there was a report that the Cambridge uh, Sustainability Institute came out that uh, it, it rated India as, as zero. I mean, but there is no policy to even discuss that. Now, I've had discussions with the Ministry of Finance and provided them information on what is happening on the task force. But uh, right now, the thinking is, and also with SEBI, they're saying they're still waiting for OSCO to come up with, uh, with, with guidelines. So, you know, there are these set norms that the biggest investors in the world, you name it, Boston Common, Vanguard, BlackRock, are actually insisting that companies disclose along those, those, those uh, given guidelines and frameworks, but there is no movement on that. Mm. So, and then we ask, okay, why aren't these investors coming to India, for instance? You know, so those are, those are the, 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 the understanding of climate risk is, is, is really, uh, you know, we, we love to define things in a particular manner. Uh, so that then somehow is, is at variance with, with, uh, with, with what some of the big global investors who we want to attract have. So that's where the friction starts. And, you know, that's, that's, that's the problem that most of the companies are facing. And uh, uh, in attracting investments and so on. So the, the, that's the real issue. I mean, I'll just give you one short example that came out last year. There's a, there's a Center for Financial Accountability, an Indian uh, NGO, that came out with a figure that last year, Indian banks lent uh, to coal power plants uh, something of the order of $9.3 billion, whereas their money going into renewables was only $3.5 billion. And even that, the $3.5 billion, was largely from the likes of uh, financial, other financial institutions like LNT Finance, IDFC, and so on. Contrast this with SoftBank that has just announced a hundred billion dollar investment in Indian renewables, <coughs> and you get the picture. Where where is the focus of foreign investors, which are money banks, and where is the focus of Indian banks? Where where are we headed, and so on? So so there has to be an understanding of climate risk, and you know we we we. To get your own, uh, of course, local conditions have to be taken into uh, into um, uh, consideration while doing it. But to insist on designing your own systems where other systems agree, and not take those further, I think somewhere, uh, I mean, it's great, it adds more jobs and, and work for consultants, but does it really benefit us attracting more investments in, 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 in uh, reaching out and uh, you know, getting more money in towards low carbon development is, is the real question. It's certainly the case uh, we've seen in other parts of the world that uh, private companies are often well in advance of government regulations. There's, uh, there's governments are always playing a catch up game. Uh, is this, did you see the government catching up here? Uh, for sure, yeah. So, you know, our work, so we, we write to the top 200 companies listed on the Indian Stock Exchange out of which 51 responded to us last year. And so they're moving ahead and they're adopting uh, international practices and some of the risk mitigating tools like carbon pricing. Mm. So they are, for instance, assuming a tax onto themselves, so they keep that money aside for CapEx reasons so that they can invest in low carbon you know, infrastructure or CapEx that they may not have money for. For instance, I mean, the highest, uh, a carbon price in India is from Ambuja Cements, which is nearly thirty dollars, which is pretty high. The others are usually in the range of seven to about fifteen dollars, and so on. So you know, companies are moving ahead of regulation, and so on. So that's what the, there are sixteen Indian companies that have taken science-based targets and are working. And so these are not just the uh, uh, um, countries, but companies which have been modeled. To their projection onto 2050 and are saying they are becoming Paris compliant mm -hmm. under two. There are 16, uh, uh, there are five Indian companies that have uh, signed up to the RD100 program that CDP runs with the climate group in India, in which companies are committing to going 100% renewable along with their global peers like, like Google, 
like Microsoft and so on. So, mm -hmm. you know, there is momentum that's happening. Now, it, through programs like RE100, you're creating the demand, and that's where the demand for these renewables are going and so on. So there is a momentum that's building up. The, the policy makers are interested. We are engaged with them. We are, we're talking to them, but uh, typically, companies have shown that they are willing to move ahead on all this. On TCFT also there is some movement and we'll be coming up with data for the end of the year. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. The Moving on to Vaibhav Chaturvedi, the, uh, I, I assume the Centre for um, Energy, Environment and Water might have a broader perspective on green infrastructure. How do you see the way in which these, these risks-based approaches to planning and management are being handled uh, from a broader perspective? Uh, thank you very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, first of all, I want to say something which, which was discussed in the first presentation in the morning, Gabriela presented, something very interesting uh, about GDP. And mm -hmm. I think a narrative currently that even if you invest in low carbon infrastructure, it is good for GDP, something like that. It's very interesting because 10 years back, the narrative was completely opposite. In fact, many research papers, including some, some of which I have written, they were always saying that the cost to GDP is maybe 4 to 5 percent or whatever. Very, now, that fear is still inside our minds. Mm -hmm. It is going to hit our GDP in a big way if you move towards low carbon infrastructure. Uh, the, this narrative is a very different narrative. It is changing. And I, at least I need to understand what has really changed. Just because solar prices are dropping, just because energy efficiency is more attractive, is it enough to change that narrative, that larger narrative, that now it is a GDP augmenting investment. I'm not very sure about we understand that, but we should, we need to understand. So that's one bigger point. Second about the question about risk, even in our understanding, how, f how future evolves is definitely conditional, conditional on how markets behave, right? And are the, do we understand the uncertainties in the market in the first place? And all these, uh, this data about how much Indian banks are lending to coal power plant versus uh, solar power plant, it's itself an indicator of how they are perceiving the market to evolve. Now, even if all of us are having this narrative that low carbon, investing in low carbon infrastructure is inevitable, at least people who are putting money on the table, maybe they have a different opinion, right? And that's what we see. Now, in a very recent analysis, we did an uncertainty in understanding is very important. And we did a bunch of 200 plus scenarios just to understand the key uncertainties in the market, be it economic growth, be it alternative cost of technologies, energy efficiency, energy demand behavior, all the biggest uncertainties. And what we do find is that for, for questions like is coal peaking, even under these like 200 plus scenarios, very, very few scenarios where we so see coal peaking. Very, very few scenarios. Generally speaking, we don't see peaking happening. Now that is the way is markets are evolving. And this talks about all the, those scenarios where solar prices drop. Even if solar prices are dropping, we don't see a fundamental shift in the way markets are operating. And the question is what needs to be done to really make that sort of shift happen. And that's where the question, I want to emphasize, especially on the electricity sector, that's the biggest, 50% of India's emissions come from this sector currently, right? Now the question of market design becomes very important. And we are, and as I see, I talk to many, many of these investors, many of these people, I don't see a, a very robust understanding of what a future market design will look like. A very, very limited understanding. And we will see if we want to go to a, say, a, a high renewable world, uh, the fundamental architecture of market will be very, very different. Mm. Very different from the way we currently see electricity markets operating in India. Very different distribution of how base load market operates versus the peak load market operates. Now these are very technical things. But the question is it has to fundamentally change. And are we building blocks to move in that direction? I am not sure if we are moving those sort of build or building those blocks to move in that mm. direction. We are talking a lot about solar prices crashing and those things, which is very, which are, which are very positive, no doubt about it, very positive. Uh, but unless policy makers start building those blocks, only then ultimately market direction will change. Only then these banks will actually start putting a huge pot of money uh, and on the table for renewables compared to coal. Uh, the incentive structure for a foreign investor is probably very different from Indian banks who are already mm -hmm. under so many NPAs, are very different incentive structures. So the way they are perceiving, the, in the risks are very different from the way foreign investors are perceiving. And ultimately, as Ila has also said, a lot of money has come to come, has to come from within India. And we have to change, shift that perception. 
is how the risk perceived by Indian investors has to change in a big way. I don't think we are doing enough as of now. Uh, but we are, even the understanding is not enough. In fact, even the stakeholder community, what needs to be done to move towards that very different, very alternative future. Mm. Even we are sort of understanding, we are iteratively understanding a lot of uh, you know, sort of this information. Finally, the point I want to make is, uh, is about the industrial sector. We don't discuss that enough. Uh, currently, 28% of India's emissions are from the industrial sector. 28%. It's a huge thing after electricity sector. Uh, and uh, something, again, very interesting, more than 80% of industrial energy use is fossil. Uh, around 17, 18% is electricity. And a lot of analysis, all the modeling analysis, the kind of work we do, many others do, have consistently shown that something very important is to electrific, electrify or electrification of end use sectors. And moving these emissions to electricity sector, maybe where they can be mitigated through solar, nuclear, mm -hmm. CCS, wherever, where it's cheaper, cheaper in a broader game. But the broader point is you have to electrify end use sectors. There is no other way. Have to electrify. Uh, the current political economy of uh, this uh, choice is very messed up in India. We cross subsidize electricity in favor of residential compared to what we do for industrial. In many other economies, a uh, uh, very important energy policy objective is, is to enhance industrial competitiveness. So they do it the other way around. They penalize the residential consumers and they subsidize industrial consumers because electricity is a huge cost for industrial goods. So it's done in a very different way in other economies. In India, this is the current way we operate. Now, unless we leave those cross subsidies, unless we keep on penalizing industries at a higher cost, why would they even move towards electrification? Right? So there is a perverse incentive currently in the system, which clearly uh, is, there is no way unless we change and attack it. And it's a very complicated thing because then you get into the discussion of, of discom state in India, which is a completely different discussion. Uh, so they are very challenging discussions. And for ultimately moving and changing the risk perceptions, we have to mm. do many things. Uh, but in the bigger pieces, it has to be uh, electricity and industrial sector. Transportation is still is 11% of our emissions. It will not go beyond 20% by 2050. All the modeling analysis suggests this. We are doing all the investment there only for local air pollution, rather than low carbon in itself. That's why it is very important for local air pollution. From carbon perspective, it is electricity and industrial sector. Uh, electricity we are doing pretty decently, I would say. Industrial, we are not really doing much. So that is where we, I think the money has to be put on table mm -hmm. because industrial investments are very long-term investments. Compared mm -hmm. to say a car on the road, which is probably 12, 13 years, industrial investment are 40, 50 years. And once you lock into that infrastructure, uh, there is a fear of the standard assets. And that is what we need to ensure that we don't, all the manufacturing capacity that is going to be added and we want it to be added for the sake of growth, we don't lock into low carbon infrastructure, uh, high carbon infrastructure. In, in the industrial domain also. That is also we should keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. So you've, you've, you've really identified there the, the transformational things that are going to be required around the market design, around uh, the way in which we need to electrify some of the, these, key, these key sectors. Ila, if I could come back to you, what, what, what do you see from your perspective as being the transformational things in, in, uh, in, in how, yes, in, 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 how thing, in, in how India is going to have to uh, deal with the low carbon transition. What, what, going beyond the incremental changes to policy, what's the transformational? So I dimension? think one very important point, two very important points that uh, Webb have raised uh, were one that uh, banks are funding power, not Webb, I think that was I mean, Banks are raising, uh, uh, are lending to such and such kind of um, uh, investment. And the second which we have raised was that the uh, electricity distribution is a different problem, right? Which meant that really today it's not the market that is functioning when you are subsidizing industrial, uh, uh, subsidizing residential and charging more for industrial. Now I would say that the essential transformation that we need to make is in terms of our broader framework and thinking about where we allow the markets to function, where, the, where there's no market failure and actually the market would give us better outcomes, especially in this space. So if we have state-led banks, state-owned banks, and most of the, what's been done is public sector banks being told to lend to such and such projects. So we had this huge growth of uh, PPP and infra lending 
which was pushed through with uh, uh, through the mechanism of uh, state-owned banks. Now, in that whole structure, what sort of understanding do markets have? Whether they have even the incentives to develop the understanding of uh, how, where business is going to be and where whether renewables will become more important or not doesn't happen because they are you know, not very clear what they are doing. So if the main financer of industry th is going to depend on instructions from above through for various political or other reasons, rather than to try to assess the market, it's a big flaw in the system. Mm -hmm. So we need to you know, reform our, now today we actually don't have much of a choice. We have all these, oh, a lot of those projects have turned NPS. So things are going to change and the banks are in trouble because they've got all these non-performing assets. So th that's the f ch uh, reform in the financial sector is one big critical element of what needs mm. to happen if we are going to set on this path of transformation. Mm. Usually we think of these two as separate things. You know, people who do climate change do climate change, people who do financial sector reform mm. think mm. that's a different thing. But Unless the two come together, unless we understand that financial sector reform is actually essential for progress and for markets to work and for markets to even have the incentive to understand where we are going, we need that. Now, it's reform in banking. And before I uh, move to the DISCOM question, I think it's also reform in uh, the bond market. I mean, we're talking about green bonds. Green bonds can't work when there is no bond market. We'll have some limited few green bonds happen, but it, it's not really going to take off because what have we done? We've got a government bond market where banks have to buy assets because they have these statutory liquidity requirements uh, so that they have to do. We have a corporate bond market which we keep discussing and do little bits of tweaks, but we don't have a clear framework for how we are going to have a bond market. Mm. No, no, no other country discusses a government bond market and a corporate bond market separately. That's an Indian innovation that we seem to think that we can break these two and still have them. But we need to talk about a bond market. And it's only when we have a deep and liquid bond market where there is participation, where there's foreign participation, not with, uh, oh, today you can do 50 billion, tomorrow you can do 52 billion, third day you can do 56 billion, where they don't really even have the incentive to properly get into the market, have people analyzing it, because we have these you know, restrictions. So unless we have a pro proper bond market, so banking sector reform, develop a, a bond market, get, get, get a public debt management agency, get it out of the banking regulator, you know, because today that's all messed up. Those are not details that we can go into here, but I just want to talk about that in this community because we seem to be thinking that those are separate things and mm. that shouldn't be the case. Now, let me come back to the DISCOM uh, question as well. I mean, I think you're absolutely right, and this is very important, that we need to revisit those questions. And perhaps revisiting those questions may mean that the state stops being the one who says, okay, price of this is so much and price of this is so much. This is what needs to be subsidized and this doesn't. One would have hoped and thought that when we reformed the economy from a centrally planned economy to a market-based economy in 1991, we would have done these reforms, you know, not just getting public sector banks out, but also pri governments fixing prices and saying this is good, this is bad, residential should have this, industrial should have this. But we haven't yet gone out, come out of it. So those are long due reforms, should have been done starting 91, we didn't, but now perhaps this is a wake up call that we need to do those now. So, so I took longer than I thought. Oh, thank you, very, very provocative and uh thoughtful uh, responses there. Uh, Kenichi, from, from we, we've heard around uh, issues raised around uh, state-owned banks, non-performing loans, uh, the need for green, uh, sorry, for bond markets uh, to be more strongly established. From the Asian Development Bank perspective, how do you see it from the outside as the, as the kind of the, the major challenges in trying to scale up 
infrastructure investment and particularly climate related infrastructure investment? Well, I think uh, uh, the development of the bond market is an important subject for India's infrastructure future development. And we have been also advocating, providing some technical assistance on some credit enhancement mechanisms to stimulate more bond. But I think some of the advanced agencies like Power Grid and also National Highway Authority of India has come to the stage that they can uh, issue a bond. And also, I, I think the discussion has not taken place, but I, I'm privately speaking. But uh, there could be some uh, scope that those uh, advanced agency, highly capable engineering agencies, may also think of a kind of green bond, uh, particularly focusing on some uh, climate-related infrastructure and seeking some uh, interested uh, investors to provide some special kind of uh, you know, or, or consideration of purchasing such kind of bond. But overall, I think uh, bond market requires also the maturity of the, also the cost recovery side. So, so in that sense, the, the energy sector uh, has a real, I, I think the energy sector has a huge potential for, for going into such direction. But again, there's some unclarity about the uh, policy directions mm -hmm. and in terms of what, what do, are we going to do with this huge renewable investments and how are they going to be integrated into the uh, entire grid systems, and then there's some technological answer to the how the uh, you know the storage energy storage can develop. So, but I think uh, I'm sure that the Ministry of Power and uh, Central Electricity Regulation Regula uh, Regulatory Authority has some ideas. But I think the important thing is probably a, you know a kind of a, a lot of transparent dialogues, uh, inviting uh, I mean uh, experts and then discuss what is the direction for India to meet all these, uh, uh, you know, all these energy sector complexities to other future. That, that can give a lot of future directions. And then, uh, so we are also trying to uh, work with Niti Aayog to, and also International Energy Association to start such a dialogue. So that's one area that we are going to do. And in terms of bond market, there's also one area that I think we see for the future uh, medium, longer term, is the municipal uh, bond market. And uh, I think somewhere in the World Bank reported, India's municipal uh, resource mobilization is somewhere like 0.5% of GDP or less. Whereas the uh, peers like South Africa, Brazil, uh, those uh, BRICS countries uh, can reach up to, say, 5% of GDP. So there's a huge potential to do that. that this requires a lot of efforts on the urban planning. So India, at this moment, urban planning is horizontal expansion rather than vertical uh, expansion. The vertical expansion can also uh, lead to a very efficient and also climate-friendly uh, development of urban areas. And this requires a lot of uh, futuristic urban land use planning and also trying to, you know, with that planning, then uh, there's a real estate, uh, you know, land value monetization, and, and that has be can become a security for future uh, municipal bond uh, uh, mobilization. So in that sense, what we have been advocating in the urban context is to, I mean, uh, smart city fits in this uh, agenda quite well, and advocating longer term urban land use planning, motivating the vertical development of urban areas, and then building the uh, kind of financial basis for urban municipalities, and that can create a uh, uh, you know, municipal bond market, and that also leads to, I mean, mu more, much, much more urban investments, but also uh, important part is making urban development more uh, carbon, uh, I mean, uh, less carbon using and uh, more efficient, and that can also motivate uh, you know, urban transport systems. Mm. So that's some area that I think uh, a lot of scope, and I think uh, uh, my understanding is the Ministry of Urban Development is preparing a new urban uh, policy. So uh, these elements are uh, hopefully, I understand, is being reflected. 
Thank you. Uh, before I turn to Damandeep to comment on these set of issues, I just put you on, no on, on notice that we, I'm in reliably informed we have some time to take questions from the floor. So prepare your questions. There's a couple of microphones there. And uh, after I turn to Damandeep, we'll, uh, we'll take some questions from, from the floor for the panel. So I've seen you scribbling away furiously, Damandeep, while uh, Isla and... Uh, and um, Vaibhav were talking. What's your perspective on, on, on the prospects for the bond mark, green bonds in, in uh, India? Uh, how, how deep can we make this market? Um, thanks, Anthony. I, I've been scribbling because I've been a big admirer of Vila's writing for a long time and I follow that. And, you know, there's always something to learn when she speaks. But uh, I, unfortunately, am not that well versed in the bond market and so on. But uh, to the point that um, the colleague from ADB mentioned, um, it, it's, you know, uh, the municipal bonds is, is a real issue. And, and, and this is, uh, I think the problem is, um, to my mind, is uh, 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 symptomatic of our planning, which tends to be top down. We've heard about smart cities today, and we've heard about other issues. And, and the prime minister was quoted just in the papers today saying that, you know, the, the the labor figures and employment figures are much better, but we don't have data. So the two real issues is that lack of data and the top-down approach. How do you go about it? Uh, what are, where is the data? Where are, what are the cities doing? Nobody has the data. Mm. Smart cities is a, a you know, consultant-driven project. It's still the definition of smart cities being evolved. Low carbon is not part of it. Mm. Do the cities have a, climate reduction target. Sydney has a climate reduction target of 90% by 2050, right? Mm. So that, the, if you take the target, then you say, okay, what do I have to do to achieve that? And they work towards that. Mexico City has a target of reducing air pollution and emissions with that. So that, with that, they evolve projects and they come in those. And, uh, you know, we, last year, we also collect data from cities. We had data from 573 cities <coughs> that responded to CDP last year. In those, uh, we, we find that they, oh, uh, there were uh, 1,045 projects that the city said they would like to do for their low carbon development. The challenge is that, okay, so you've identified those, and this was about $52 billion worth of projects. Now, those, how do you then, once you have that database, then you work with them to make those bankable, so to uh, invite investors into that. And that's where your municipal bonds and others can come in. That requires a degree of autonomy that the municipalities need to have to reach out to these investors, as well as, again, uh, you know, capacity to come up with these things. So the whole idea is you know, target setting. Where are you? Are you thinking in the low carbon pathway, or are you thinking along projects to attract money? That's, that's the real so there's a need to create a, a virtuous circle between regulation, uh, planning, uh, the finance sector, and so on to to get with things well aligned. And and yeah. so we'll turn to the floor. If uh, there are any questions that uh, someone would like to please come to come to the microphone uh, and state your name and organisation and uh, whether you want to ask a general question of the panel or you'd like to target someone in particular, please, go ahead. Hello? There you go. So my question... Uh, can you say uh, your name and where my you're from? My name is Tilak and which, and which organization? Uh, I'm uh, working for Defence. My question is to Gagandeep, sir. Sir, why don't we, as a country, join OECD? <laughs> that, that's, that's not my, I mean, the, the criteria, I think Anthony can better describe what the criteria to joining OECD, and whether we want to do it, what are the benefits, I think. Pros and cons. Perhaps. I think we are part of the larger multilateral organizations like G20 and, and, and the UN system. So some of those concerns are addressed through those, but specifically OECD, I'm afraid I, I would not be able to answer that. So, uh, 
Anyone, anyone of you could answer, please? Well, as, uh, as they say in the classic, that's above my pay grade. But, um, and, uh, and unfortunately, Gabriella's left the room. She will give a great answer for this, I'm sure. You heard the minister talk this morning about how the OECD and India have had a zigzag relationship. At the moment, we're in a very much cooperative uh, mode uh, where we have India as a key partner. Uh, India is represented on many of the committees and initiatives and platforms at the OECD and have a strong and constructive contribution. And the flow of ideas and policy insights and experience goes both ways. OECD countries are learning from the Indian experience and India, I believe, is learning from aspects of the OECD countries' experience. So that's the, the key role of OECD as a policy think tank and do tank is to try and raise the general level of understanding around economic policy, around social issues, around, in, envir and around environmental issues, by peer review, by experience sharing and so on. And I think we're doing really well at that with India. Of course we can do more, and this is an example exactly of, of how we're trying to build on that. Uh, and um, Gabriela mentioned a particular project we have on, at this stage, on on investing uh, in low energy, sorry, in low in low carbon energy investment in in, in India that we are uh, just we are just embarking on. And this is a good example of in depth stakeholder engagement that we are doing with uh, with India and with organisations in India and with the with the government. I think it's a very ro a very rosy future ahead. So, who's? Uh, oh, you will. We might take another. We might take another question. Who's? Ah, so we obviously haven't had coffee this morning. So um, I might take the opportunity then to uh, jump on perhaps a, a slightly different aspect. Um, to what extent do you do? And I'll out put this to end to all the to all the panel. Whoever would like to jump jump in. We hear a lot about um, uh, quality infrastructure. Does does this resonate in India? What 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 do you th do, do you think the authorities, the companies, the uh, regulatory authorities understand what is meant by quality infrastructure? Oh, uh, quality infrastructure. Uh, is something that we've started talking about in the last couple of years particularly. So there was an Asian Ministerial for Disaster uh, Risk Reduction where the Prime Minister announced that India would uh, uh, help uh, set up an international coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure. And since then there have been a number of uh, um, meetings, workshops, panels, places where uh, we've been discussing this. The first challenge that comes up is that when people say quality infrastructure, uh, immediately we hear 10 people saying, uh, you know, even before quality, even if we get infrastructure of the standards as of today. So quality should mean that uh, the current standards are being enforced mm -hmm. and that now we are going to upgrade those standards and talk about getting them enforced, right? So uh, to today's uh, standards and their enforcement is very poor. So immediately we get responses like this bridge fell off, that flyover uh, fell down, the, a flood happened and uh, yeah, a wall didn't uh, collapse. So the uh, debate see, takes us back to the question uh, where we are saying, are we e even able to build infrastructure not of better quality than what we are currently doing, but even of the quality which is currently the accepted normal standard? And can we ensure that uh, whatever we are trying to do, at least that is happening? So that's my, uh, you know, that's actually what I was talking about earlier as well, because that has become a very, very big concern. I don't know how many of you have noticed, but a lot of the um, new, there are a number of news stories which report that things that are even under construction, even before they've had the chance to wear and tear or get earthquake shocks or floods or you know climate-related shocks, even in the process of construction, they fall down. So you know that's 
that's really today's concern in India. I've just been told that we need to end this end the session now because we need to take a bit of a break before the next session. So uh, please, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our pa our panelists, uh, Kanichi Yokoyama, uh, uh, Ila Patnaik, Damandeep Singh, and Vaibhav Chaturvedi. Uh, thank you very much for your insights and your time this morning. And if you could join me in thanking them in the usual way, thank you.